Welcome to the 50 best masterclass in association with world's 50 best restaurants. My name is Douglas Blyde and I am a drinks advisor to several stars, a columnist and a general consumer and lover of wine. What I'm going to be sharing with you are really my insights into getting the best out of stemware in giving you the most enjoyable access to your wines. So today we're working with new Turkish made glassware from a company with 85 years of experience in perfecting simplicity. The flawless, joyful vials of distinction. They're strong, they're lead-free crystal, they're clear, and they are basically a frame to a picture that heightens the picture in itself. We're going to begin with a white wine from Rioja. Rioja and white are not known in a particularly obvious way to the general consumer, but white Rioja really does capture the Spanish sun in a particular way. Notice when I pour, I'm only going to go to the point in the glass where it is at its most broad. The thing about wine is it should be enjoyed little and often. If you keep a small amount in the glass, it keeps the temperature nice and cool, and it also allows the build-up of flavours to be amplified in this tulip bowl. They really do gain gravitas as you then swirl and enjoy the wine. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into how to taste wine. So what I'd like to do is to hold it by the stem, hold it up to our eye line and give it a gentle swell which makes us look professional and it also coats the side of the glass. These little droplets are known as tears, legs, cathedral windows even, the Scottish in whiskey call them stockings. The more legs you see, the more ABV, alcohol by volume, the higher the alcohol in the wine. And the longer these little droplets take to descend, these stalactites take to fall, the more sweetness is there, the more sticky sweetness from sugar. So just looking at that, it looks relatively light in alcohol and dry, even though of course the liquid itself is wet. The next thing is to have a look at the liquid, have a look at the wine, spread it out in this wonderful glass and think about the colour because white wines gain colour with age and reds lose it, rather like the pigment in a human head of hair basically. Whites gain, reds lose. This is still youngster so it's really quite pale. In fact the grape variety here is from this Reda Verdejo, Spanish Verde green. It does indeed have green hints on this white Rioja. The next stage is to give it another swirl, this time for the aroma. So we're bombarding all the molecules against each other, rather like wafting a perfume sample I guess, and uh, we're exaggerating the flavours. I can even smell it from here as I do it, but I'm going to take it to my nose. And I find smelling wine is better if your mouth is slightly open. Why are we sniffing this liquid? Why are we sniffing this wine? Because wine has in the region of a thousand different volatile components and we really want to get into, into some of those. Incidentally, wine is really grapey. Even though it's made from grapes, wine is special because grapes, when turned into wine, give you, unlike any other fruit, a wider spectrum of flavour than you can imagine. So, give it a sniff and get to those lovely, again, green, perhaps almond, green almond notes, there's a little bit of marzipan to a hint of cream. The next stage is of course to have a taste, so I'm going to do two different tastes. The first taste wakes up my palate. Alcohol is being introduced, I'm just getting accustomed to it. The second is really a way of mining, of getting far more into the wine itself. What I'm going to do is to Noting the word reverse, whistle, reverse whistle. Pull a little bit of, of liquid into the mouth and then pull a little bit of air through it. A tablespoon or so of wine and then draw the air through. Which sounds obscene, but that's doing the same as swirling on the palate. You're waking it up, you're getting into the wine 
lots of different flavors are present and you're coating the tongue which registers at the tip sweetness this is however bone dry down the sides refreshing acidity my mouth is really watering there's no bitterness which you would find at the back maybe there's a hint of umami towards the middle though which i find in things like cooked mushroom seaweed soy sauce maybe there's just a hint of umami this large elegant red glass is quite a presence on the table it has such a broad bowl so that this is like a speaker to give absolute lift to more delicate, elegant wines of finesse, often with a little bit of age to them as well. This is great for great varieties that can be a little bit shy, a little bit tender, such as Pinot Noir. This really helps to heighten the whispers of those sensitive, sometimes retiring, hard to get a handle on grape varieties. This is being broad, a way of, of coaxing out those more reticent of renditions. Here we have an older Rioja, 2015, harvested five years ago. What were you doing in 2015? We have here a wine that has begin, it's beginning to lose its primary fruit. It's not so much about the, the vivid over primary fruit forward flavors. It's beginning to be more mineral, more perhaps of the earth, more truffle notes will come forward. I would just like to say a glass of this scale is a joy to play with, to swell, even if I relax it tends to still keep going. These have a life of their own. The liquid just leads itself around the glass. One other thing, because it's so large, if we angle the glass away, we can see with this red, there is a little area where the sea meets the shore, where the liquid meets the side of the glass. We can see a little area of clarity. This is known as the meniscus. The larger the meniscus, the older the wine. And we can also see that in the color. Remember, reds lose color with age. Compared to the last one, it's becoming a little bit more garnet rather than purple. It's beginning to lose its first stages of youth. It's becoming wiser, if you will. I'd also like to have a sniff. I'm almost getting graphite. I always think of graphite in things like Negronis. I'm getting graphite, I'm getting mineral, uh, elements, I'm, I'm not picking up fruit. It's far more about structure, and I bet the texture is going to be good too. Mm. Texture is very important in wine. It's not often talked about, but for me, wine is becoming increasingly about the feel of it, the way it coats the mouth. And I begin to think about food matches as a result. I begin to think about more sort of elegant, gentle reds going with game as we go forward perhaps into autumnal months. I begin to think about mushrooms. I think about wild mushrooms on the forest floor, scavenging for those in, in a responsible way, of course. So this glass, much more kind, nurturing towards the more shy of the grape varieties, especially with a little bit of age to them. Next, I am delighted to share with you the Stem Zero Master. This is the master. It will work with anything. It could even work with a really crisp Pilsner. It is going to make whatever you put in it much more an exciting operation. The Stem Zero Master is great with champagne. It's great with sweet wine, with rosé, with red, with white. It is a transformative being. I love the fact that it is so anonymous looking. It's so modest, so humble in its overall feel, yet it really is a tool for your toolkit to access wine. So I'm going to be using it for this pink Rioja. 
made of tempranillo. Tempranillo comes from temprano. It means early ripeness. Spanish for early is temprano, a grape that can get frighteningly high alcohol if you leave it in the vineyard to ripen for too long, though birds will come and munch away on it if you do. But if you hit it, if you harvest it at its perfect optimum time, you get a really lovely, juicy, yet refreshing feel, exemplified in this rosé. Generally, it's worth noting that lighter styles of rosé tend to be drier, whereas reds tend to be sweeter. That's the semiotics of it. So I am now showing a young red in this glass, which is good for, for powerful reds. This is the Stem Zero Powerful Red. Why uh, is this here? Because this powerful red has life verb vividness, and I don't want to tame that. I want to actually exaggerate it. I want its, its, uh, its energy to come forward in a more audible way, a more tangible way. So in this case, we have a Rioja from 2017, lightly chilled, which I think just pulls the fruit together. It sharpens the cheekbones, if you will, of this wine. But you could also use this for really vivid Zinfandel from California or Primitivo as it's often referred to down in Puglia. Or you could use this for Syrah, Syrah from the Rhone, all roads lead to Rhone, Syrah, Shiraz from Australia. This is also good for Sangiovese, Blood of Jove, Sangiovese from Tuscany. But here we have another rendition of Tempranillo in a particularly vivid a juicy context, lightly chilled for freshness, to just pull it into shape. Immediately I'm getting the primary cherry fruit coming forward. It really is giving me a, a sense of a freshness. Mm. One thing about a good glass is it can somehow reduce the tannin, almost like in black tea. It can reduce the bitterness. The incubation of flavours in that big, tall chimney give you a sensation of smoothness. It's really a piece of magic almost. I'd like you to meet the volcano, the red wine volcano. What a tremendous name for this absolutely arresting design. Just look at it. We've got everything that we have talked about thus far, an elegant stem. When you hold that to your eyes, it's absolutely in your vision. It just elevates the liquid, actually, and, uh, you know, morally, metaphysically, you choose the word. One thing I would say about this broad, tapered beast, magnificent beast, more beauty than beast, it's worth investing in good glassware. Why? Well, this may sound odd. I am a drinks enthusiast, particularly so wine. But I will drink slower in something like this. I may even drink less, because what this does is it tells me to take your time, to take care that this is an important moment. This is a meditation, uh, if you will, rather than just something to slake your thirst after a difficult day of 3,000 uh, Zoom calls. This is a means to the chapter of the evening to make a mark that you're entering a different sphere. I have chosen, or left till last, the most significant of the wines. So we've got a wine that has been slumbering in a mixture of cask and then uh, obviously tanks to begin and in the bottle, carefully looked after, been slumbering, developing gradually for nine years, almost a decade. So I want to gently wake it up. In many ways, you could do that with a decanter, but there's really no need here because this is doing the same job. This, in a sense, is its own decanter, its own miniature portable decanter. Just look at the way it behaves. It's, I don't know, it, it, is, it is a sense of, 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 it's a moment being created just by, by that. It's almost like making pottery, <laughs> in a sense. <sighs> the aroma here is, is so heightened. There's so much truffle in here. One thing to do is 
you know, get a few of these and actually go between them with different wines and you'll see that you, know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. This wine won't work so well in the delicate white. These have been really carefully designed and hand blown by master craftsmen. This is one piece, all blown, but uh, for me this, this is the, the ultimate wine glass for, for big reds which have mellowed over time. Big reds, I'm thinking Napa, mountain Napa. I'm thinking really big, costly, but worth it stand out pomerols, I'm thinking of poyak, I'm thinking of, of basically posh reds that need everything to pay homage to, to really get the most out of them, to, to elegantly frame them. I do wish you could join me and taste what I'm tasting and uh, maybe you will uh, also join and, and get some of these lovely glasses and, and top them up to your heart's delight and savour really the moment because you know, time has become very important. We all have great expectations and I think to fulfil them to our best ability, we really need the best tools, the best assets and uh, glassware is going to keep on giving as a gift to your palate and to your soul. Buonasera, I'm uh, Giorgio Bargiani, the egg mixologist of the Connaught Bar. And today we're mixing, we're mixing Dalmor and creating the Mediterraneo. It's time to mix. What we present you today first is our taken on a whiskey sour, of course based on the wonderful uh, King Alexander whiskey uh, made by Dalmor. The drink that we're gonna present you now is really inspired by what we do and who we are. Italian bartenders with a love for, for great seasonal and local products. So, we start with the whiskey. Dalmor King Alexander III, 50 milliliter, that will give, of course, the body and the personality to the cocktail. You really want your spirit to shine. That's why we always use a larger measure for uh, whiskey supper. Whiskey sour is not just about sour, there is always a counterpart, which is the sweet part that we use. And, and for today, we use our sage flower syrup. You can easily make a sage uh, syrup at home, even if you don't get the flower, you can easily buy good quality sage, make a, a tea out of it, infusing it in hot water for about four to five minutes. I would say 10 leaves for half liter of water and then you add the same amount of sugar so you do a light uh, sage syrup. As a sour part as I was mentioning of course we want to use fresh citruses, Italian fresh citruses. So here we have a blend of lime, lemon, grapefruit and bergamot right from the south, the heart of south of Italy. It's always very important to use fresh, freshly squeezed citruses to achieve the freshness and the zestiness of your cocktail. What we do then to make the drink even more interesting, we're gonna add a, a fabulous chili liqueur, espelette chili liqueur or poivre d'espelette as, the, as they would say in, in France when, where this chili is from. You can do your own, as you, you do your chili oil probably, you can do your own chili liqueur, infusing some chilies, your, the chilies of your choice, in, uh, in, for instance, vodka, or maybe a good uh, uh, white rum. So you infuse it for at least a day, I would say five chili for a bottle, and after that you just maybe wanna add 100, uh, gram of, of uh, sugar syrup. Now, when we talk about a sour cocktail, definitely the taste is key, but the texture play a key role. So what we do to enhance the, the texture, the softness, the um, creaminess of our cocktail, we add some uh, fresh egg white. It's very important that the egg white will be very, very fresh. As when you make 
cakes, for instance, you want the freshest. Because at the end, you can buy pasteurized, but if you use the white of an egg, it will be a raw egg. So, extremely fresh. And here we add 50 milliliter of our uh, egg white. Now, just before we shake, we want to emulsify this egg white, blending it with an end blender. So we're gonna add ice to our shaker. It's important every time that you shake that you fill your shaker to the top. You really want your shaker to be full to achieve the best result to shake your cocktail perfectly. Shake with all the energy that you have. Really transmit it to the shaker and to the cocktail that you will do. We double strain it in order to get rid of all the ice bits we might have created. As um, I would say garnish of this cocktail, we add a piece of a beautiful crystal clear ice. This ice definitely make the cocktail way more appealing, way more sexy if I can say that. Um, but it's not just about visual. These eyes enrich again the texture of the cocktail you're gonna have. You can buy crystal clear eyes, but more easily you can make it at home. You can either use a plastic container uh, and insulate it with an insulated material that could be bubble wrap and uh, aluminum foil. You can use polystyrene as well. Otherwise, you can buy a food box and uh, leave it open in your freezer. The food box must be insulated. So it's something that you will use, for instance, to do a, a picnic uh, in the park. Just before we enjoy our cocktail, we're gonna add our Italian essence, the aperitivo bitter. So we're gonna add 10 ml to it to add uh, an extra bitter note and for sure to again recall our uh, um, Italian heritage. The Mediterranean cocktail for you. So this cocktail is really a celebration. This cocktail has got a full body has got a, a big personality that we're gonna let shine through one of the ingredients that makes Dalmor so special, which is sherry wine. Let's start with our ingredient. For the pot, we're gonna use Dalmor 15 years old and we're gonna pour 50 ml. Afterwards, we're gonna add 20 ml of one of our preparation, which is a blend of two different sherries, Oloroso and Palo Cortado, which are sous vide infused with tonka beans, cocoa ask, and maize blades. So the way we do, we vacuum pack sherry, together with the three spices I just mentioned, and we put in a water bath for one hour at 60 degrees. If you don't have a, a sous vide machine at home, what you can do, you, if you can use stove that keep consistent temperature, you put a, a pan with water inside, uh, above it, a temperature to make sure that the temperature no rise or, or go uh, down. And with a Ziploc bag, you can put all the ingredient and leave it there for an hour. So the result will be pretty similar. The last ingredient we're gonna add is our Vesper bitters. Vesper bitter is a combination of, again, tonka beans, 
and the apricot kernels. This will make um, shine even more uh, the, the vanilla notes, the, uh, the complexity of the whiskey. In terms of bitters, we do it uh, ourselves, but you can easily buy good quality bitters uh, off the shelf. So now we're coming back on our throwing technique. So for a throwing technique that you can make it at home, I'm sure will be a lot of fun to learn how to do it. You need a two pieces shaker and uh, an author strainer. A strainer that looks like this. So in the big part of the shaker, you put ice and you, let's say, lock it inside with the Oton strainer. On the small side of the shaker, on the small part, you add your ingredients. The first movement will be putting the ingredient in the ice, then holding the bigger part of the shaker up slightly above your head and start pouring in the small one. And while you're pouring, you bring it down. So I'll personally look at the liquid while I'm doing it, but you can definitely do as is more convenient for you. And you do at least five times. Here we are. You might have learned already our love for ice, so we're gonna place a wonderful piece of ice in our glass right before we pour our cocktail on top of it. And that is the pot. Salute. Hi, my name is Andrea and today we are here in Mebisemi and I'm gonna show you how to make two cocktails. The one and only and second chance, both based on sustainability. In our first cocktail, we are gonna avoid one of the biggest wastage in our industry, which is water. And we're gonna make the whole cocktail based on one single element. In this case, a coconut. How we're gonna do it? Very simple, we're gonna Break this coconut and turn it into some beautiful coconut water, coconut flakes, and coconut milk. And then I'm gonna show you how to combine all of these ingredients together for make a sharing cocktail for when you're gonna invite your friends at home. In our second drink, we're gonna give a second chance to coffee. Here in maybe semi, we source and roast our own coffee for our espresso martini. And once it's been used and it loses lots of its flavor, we're gonna leave it overnight in water and then ferment it to make this beautiful coffee kombucha, which is gonna be mixed with sherry and rum to create this refreshing and beautiful cocktail. The reason why I'm using Flor de Cana is because of this spicy, chocolatey, zesty flavor that goes very well with those type of cocktails. Okay, let's get started. For our first cocktail, you're gonna need a jar to measure all the ingredients. Because it's a sharing cocktail, we're gonna go bigger in volume. We're gonna start with Flor de Cana 12. It's at 30 mils per cocktail. Because we're making a big batch, we go with 150. The reason why I choose this rum today is because of its chocolatey, zesty flavor, which will go perfect with the other ingredients in the drink. Our second ingredient is gonna be dry vermouth. Same amount. So in this case, again, 150. This is gonna give a, a nice uh, acidic note to the cocktail. Our next ingredient comes from the coconut flesh. Once you take the coconut flesh, you shave it, dehydrate it, you can use an oven if you are at home to make some nice coconut flakes, which then we are gonna toast 
and turn into a toasted coconut syrup. How, do, how to make a toasted coconut syrup is very simple. Equal parts toasted coconut and sugar and uh, half of it of coconut water. So in this case, is 100 grams of sugar, 100 grams of coconut flakes and 50 grams of water. Because we're not gonna use any bar tool in this cocktail and it's gonna be pre-diluted and ready to go from the fridge, we're gonna add a little bit of extra dilution which comes from the coconut water. For this amount of cocktail, we add 50 ml. The only ingredient missing right now is the coconut milk. We are gonna add it to our batch and then just leave it in the fridge to clarify. So as you can see, the milk is starting to coagulate right now. What we're gonna do, we're gonna put it in the fridge, leave it for a couple of hours and then filter it. So we're gonna put this on the side and here we have another one which has been setting on the fridge before for a couple of hours, ready to be filtered. So now all you have to do is taking a coffee filter or a cheesecloth and just strain your cocktail through it. And what's gonna come underneath is a clear and clean final cocktail. So now I'm gonna leave this here for about an hour to filter completely and this is what's gonna look like once you're done. The final product is clean, filtered with this beautiful golden color, ready to be served. How to serve it? Very simple. Take it out from your fridge, get a beautiful wine glass, and fill it up with some frozen coconut flesh instead of ice. three or four pieces should be enough. And then, just put it. So by doing it this way, you're not gonna waste any time making the cocktail during your party, but you can just pour and focus by entertaining your guests at home. The reason why we serve it with frozen coconut as ice is because it's gonna keep your drink cold all the way to the end. And then once it's gonna be defrosted, you can have it as a little snack. Now we're gonna move on to our next cocktail, the second chance. Here in Baby Sammy, we love coffee. We source and roast our own beans, which then we use to make our espresso martini. But once the coffee has been used, there is still some flavor in it. So we're gonna keep it just overnight in the fridge with water and then we let it ferment and, and create this beautiful coffee kombucha. Very refreshing with a little bit of acidity in it. We're then gonna mix it with Pedro Jimenez sherry, which gives some body and nuttiness to the cocktail. And of course, Flor de Caña 12. So to make this cocktail, you only need a simple shaker. We're gonna fill up with some ice. This drink again, is very, very simple to make. We are gonna use 40 ml of Flor de Caña 12. Followed by half of it, so 20 of Pedro Jimenez Sherry. as a last ingredient, 90 ml of coffee kombucha. This has been fermented for about, for about a week. So we have a, a good light acidity and fizziness into it. And the, the cocktail is done. What we're gonna do now, we're gonna do a little throwing just to incorporate well the ingredients and cool down the temperature and give some extra dilution. By doing this, I'm adding some aeration to the cocktail and cooling down the temperature without giving an aggressive shake 
which is gonna kind of compromise the light flavor of this cocktail. And it's done. We're gonna serve it into this beautiful spelt coffee cup on a big block of ice. As a final touch, we're gonna garnish it with a very simple lime leaf to give a little touch of aroma at the nose for when you're gonna approach your cocktail. I recommend to leave this drink as the last one of the night. It's gonna be the grand finale, the closing element of your night. It's very clean and it's gonna be a perfect night cup. So I hope you enjoy, learn how to make those cocktails and I really hope you're gonna make it for your next party at home. Hi, my name is Christian Hodeyuk, the Executive Beverage Manager for Galaxy Bar. The cocktail that I will be making, it is a twist on the classic gin and tonic. I've called it Mare and Tonic. Spain being homeland of so many beautiful uh, gin and tonics creations has definitely inspired me to use this beautiful uh, gin Mare heading all the way from the south sunny coast of Catalonia. The gin is very much citrus driven with a beautiful herbaceous notes to it. It has a plenty of uh, a pleasant uh, thyme and basil and raspberry aroma that really plays uh, an important role when you make a gin and tonic. And I think our twist um, is somehow related to that. Uh, we have created our homemade uh, fennel cordial uh, that particularly wo works well with uh, the combination of all of the components um, of this gin. And I think with yet Mediterranean tonic and a touch of rose water on the side really complements uh, the stamp on such a classic. The ingredients that I'll be using today are homemade fennel seeds cordial, rose water, Mediterranean tonic and of course Gimare. To start you need a tall glass full of ice, then 25 ml of fennel seeds cordial that brings a lot of uh, wonderful Mediterranean flavors to it. Then three dashes of rose water, uh, followed by 50 ml of this wonderful Mediterranean um, gin. Uh, guys, please be careful with your ingredients. Make sure that you follow the spec pretty well. And just to finish off, we're gonna top it off with the Mediterranean tonic. Simple, light, refreshing. Now is the time to dress the drink. I have chosen sage, being a typical Mediterranean herb that brings a lot of uh, wonderful fresh notes and a celery ribbon. I've particularly chosen sage and this beautifully cut celery ribbon uh, to enhance your sensorial experience and allow you to smell the drink uh, and the aromas of Mediterranean before you even taste it. For my stamp on a classic, I have chosen a watermelon and feta salad, hailing all the way from the Aegean Sea. However, I do believe that my creation will work really well with fried calamari or salad niçois served al fresco. I'll be making soy mediterraneo, inspired by the salty waters of Mediterranean Sea. Uh, it is a twist to a classic dirty martini, which I'm a big fan of. I've particularly chosen this drink to enhance the qualities of Jean Marais, as well as create a beverage uh, that works well as an aperitif style drink. To start with, we need a mixing glass full of ice and the first component of this drink is the brine. We're gonna add 10 ml directly into the mixing glass, followed by 50 ml of Jean Marais. I'm gonna stir it down to make sure that all components are well incorporated together and the temperature of the drink is well maintained. Once that's done, we're gonna serve this drink in a well-chilled martini glass.
garnished with three drops of this wonderful fragrant Spanish oil and a one caper berry. Salud. I've paired my drink with Greek inspired style sushi, but I also believe it can work really well with any kind of rich fish because of the saltiness in the martini. For any aspiring bartenders out there, I would definitely recommend to work on your craft, train your palate, and don't be afraid to be creative.